Uh, okay, De dear participants, please take your seats. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today in our breakout session. Uh, it's a s quite small and cozy one. Uh, after the morning se session in a very, very crowded room, I think we lost a few people to lunch. So it's my pleasure to welcome everyone here today. And uh, our session today is dedicated to the question of climate finance and how, where we are going to find all this necessary funding, all these opportunities that exist to uh, try and achieve our climate goals. So we're going today to have a few uh, presentations, keynote speakers for our session, and hopefully have a discussion on uh, reflections from the speeches. Our speakers today are here. I see them in the room. Uh, we have today Dr. Alberto Isgood, representative of United Nations SCAP and uh, uh, Macroeconomic Division. Welcome, please. Our second presentation will be by Dr. Pichaya Sirivunabud, and uh, she represents uh, ADB. And uh, third presentation from Dr. Kanita Tambunler Chai, representative of Tulalongkorn University. And our last but not least presentation by Ms. Heinle from Impact. Thank you and please welcome. Um, we also will have an opening, opening speech. Hopefully we can connect online to uh, Dr. Corrado Topi. He is the head of uh, Center for Climate for Sustainability Bangkok at ACI Asia. He cannot be here in person, but uh, hopefully he can give us his opening remarks online. I'll try to, uh, we will try with the technical team to connect him online. And after the opening presentations, we'll try to have a discussion and Q&A, depending how we are with time. Hopefully, we will be able to answer a few questions of interest. Thank you. Um, a few housekeeping rules. I guess everyone is quite aware that time is of the essence, so we'll try to keep to 15 minutes per speaker with presentations. And later on, we'll have a discussion and uh, questions will be posted on Mentimeter, so we'll try to do this online and uh, see the results if possible. Uh, also, if anyone from the audience has any questions, we, of course, can uh, give you the floor to uh, present your questions. Uh, now let us try to connect. No? Okay, the technical team is telling me that we do not have connection to Dr. Corrado, is that so? Okay. Um, apologies for this. So, um, let us then begin with the first keynote presentations for today. Uh, our first speaker, let me give the floor to the first presenter today, Dr. Alberto Eastgood. And the topic will be bridging the gap in bridging the financing gap in Asia and Pacific. Good afternoon. I would like to make a presentation of a report prepared by ESCAP. It was uh, published uh, last year, but I think still relevant. And this is the title. Uh, if you're interested, you can find it online. Uh, this, this report is about uh, how different actors can uh, enhance access to, to finance 
to sustainable finance in developing countries, particularly in Asia, of course, Asia and the Pacific. <clears throat> and the three main actors are policymakers, regulators, and the private, uh, private finance sector. We have a lot of recommendations. I'll try to be selective and brief. I don't want to bore you with too many recommendations. But at the end of the story, all these recommendations are encapsulated in 10 principles. Now, the, the starting point is the needs. How much money is necessary uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals and fundamental climate objectives? And there are many estimations out there. A popular one is this by the G20 Independent Expert Group, published last year, and it's a total of $3 trillion for all developing countries, excluding China. Uh, China is not included because it's a country that has a lot of potential to, to achieve you know, these uh, financial goals. Now, the, the three trillions, uh, and this is a global number, um, are divided um, into domestic resource mobilization, which is public uh, finance, uh, and local finance, and that will be two trillion, that is uh, two thirds, and another uh, one trillion comes from uh, external finance. We are going to focus in, in this presentation mostly on local finance. Now, to give you an, a, a little bit more information of the particular the Southeast Asia region, in 2019, ESCAP uh, prepared a very comprehensive report on financial needs for the SDGs, and uh, it was much more detailed than other studies, I have to say. It was very, very carefully done. And for Southeast Asia, we come up with a number of 6% of the GDP, which is an important number, I have to say, in additional finance. And this 6% of the GDP is more or less equally divided between uh, climate action and infrastructure and then the social sectors, you know, poverty reduction, education, and health. So this is a this is major uh, financial commitment. Uh, everywhere we are seeing that developing countries are falling behind, they're not achieving the SDGs, and the, the amount of finance I need to mobilize is, is very huge, you know, so it's, it's challenging. So let's see what we can do. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate too much on that. The sustainable finance ecosystem is a very complicated uh, system. It includes uh, all, the, all the aspects of a financial system, but in addition to that, it includes verification for, you know, for uh, green uh, uh, actions, uh, it's, it's a lot more, more complex. But let's not elaborate on this, or it will take us probably the 15 minutes we have. So let's, let's start uh, focusing on what governments can do, right? As I said, governments, regulators, and private finance are the, the key actors we are considering. Now, governments uh, face many, many challenges, and these challenges can give us cues of what could be the solutions. The first one is that this very limited uh, availability of uh, NDC financial plans, right? Um, for this report, I've been reviewing all the NDCs and trying to locate you know, financial information. Only a limited number of countries actually even present the numbers, how much it's going to cost to achieve their NDCs. Uh, and much less, you know, to have a proper plan. And this is, I think, is a very important thing that governments uh, need to do. Because um, that, that really can, can you know, bridge the gap, uh, so to speak, between the aspirations and the actual achievement, right? If you don't have a plan and you don't figure out, okay, where the money can come from, it becomes much more difficult. Now, granted that the NDCs uh, are based on, you know, on aspiration as well, right? Not all the, all the money for the NDCs is secured. You know, there's some, something that, you know, some money that will be raised but it's important still to plan uh, for those, um, those funds. The, financial, uh, fin the sustainable finance landscape is changing, it's complex. This is another challenge that many governments uh, face to keep up with all, all these developments. The harmonization of different climate finance sources is another issue. We will talk a little more about some of the solutions that can address this. 
There are also more general problems that governments have in terms of not enough uh, local currency financing and problems sometimes, you know, low credit ratings that make it difficult to access international financing. The lack of bankable green project pipeline is another issue. We are working on that in ESCA. We have a, a project at the moment. But uh, you need to have, you know, bankable projects that are ready uh, to be financed, and that's quite important. It's, it's not a new topic. It has been discussed for a long time. Um, and then, well, LDCs and SEEDs have uh, special challenges. What tools are available, what instruments? Well, GSSS plus bonds is one of the areas. I will, I will talk a little bit about that. Then access to multilateral climate funds um, you know, for many countries is, is challenging. NDC financing strategies, as I mentioned before, uh, sustainable finance roadmaps, a little bit of a having a proper policy framework, you know, to access in this finance. Carbon markets is a kind of new frontier that, you know, is, is being developed. Uh, regarding um, official uh, finance, uh, this is data from the OECD. It has been increasing, not, not a lot. I know the famous 100 billion that was promised a um, long time ago. Uh, and finally, I think was achieved in 2022. This is the proportion that goes to Asia and the Pacific developing countries. We are talking about 32 trillion in, uh, sorry, 32 billion, uh, I'm getting too excited, uh, in 2021. Uh, most of these funds are for uh, mitigation. Uh, adaptation is growing, but still it's not the main use. And most of, the, of this money comes as loans rather than, than grants. Uh, GSSS plus bonds have been increasing quite dramatically, 2021, 2022. Data for 2023 is not in this, in this uh, graph, but it's available and is similar to 2022, no, no major change. And uh, we have uh, additional data for up to the first half of 2024. But the important thing to notice here is that there's a huge concentration of these um, access to these tools, to GSS plus bonds, in the richest countries, not the developed and high income countries, which represent 142 billion of a total, right? Um, China is another very, very, you know, successful country, a very large country with a huge financial market. But if you look at the rest of the middle income developing countries in Asia and the Pacific, it's only about 20 billion uh, per year. So it's, it's, it's not, not as much. Uh, in this particular region, Southeast Asia, there's a lot of progress. Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia have been raising about over two, three, two billion dollars uh, per year, which is, is quite, quite good. Vietnam is a little, uh, a little more, more lagar, but it's also, you know, uh, looking into this area. So what can governments do? And please, uh, Anastasia, <laughs> let me know about the timing now because I have still a lot to say. Uh, well, I mean, an important recommendation would be uh, to consider the NDCs as a very useful tool, not only to, to plan for the environmental, you know, things that want to be achieved, but also uh, to, to have a, a proper financial plan. I mean, this is something that we emphasize a lot. The development of pipelines of bankable projects is another important recommendation. Uh, the other thing is that uh, to support the financial sector and the private sector to plan for net zero. You know, many, many uh, private uh, entities have their own uh, net zero plans, but I think it's good to, to work collectively with the, uh, you know, in collaboration with the public sector and the private sector to, to advance in this area. There are issues about the taxation regime. You know, we all know that... Uh, you know, for um, renewable energy, for example, to be profitable for, f for financiers. I mean, it has to be, it has to be a proper uh, taxation that does not subsidize fossil fuels and ideally it taxes fossil fuels. This is a, a very challenging thing, you know, because uh, carbon taxation is very regressive and uh, the people who, you know, the lower income people are the ones who are going to receive most of the brunt of these taxes. So it's a very, very challenging, but it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, 
Okay, and this for now. I think, yeah, the issue of partnership is also, is also important to mention. There is the example of the Just Energy Transition Partnership that started in, in 2022. There has not been a huge progress in, in this area. But I think it's a, it's a good model in terms of working collaboratively between governments, regulators, and, and financiers. Okay, what regulators can do, and I guess here I probably will start to go a bit quicker. Um, so this, um, um, this an, a number of issues that are, I mean, are important uh, for, for users of, um, of climate disclosures is that uh, there is an increase in the, in the availability or in general and um, they start to be used more uh, in decision making, right? Uh, however, they, they still, uh, there are things that need to be improved, right? So, um, how, are, how are the regulators supporting these uh, government pri priorities? There are a number of, of tools, like the Green Bond Framework, for example, Environmental and Social Risk Management, Sustainable Finance Roadmap, etc that can, can provide guidance um, to the climate, uh, to the private sector, to the financial institutions. The, the new uh, International Sustainability Standards Board um, are very important, not because they are providing some uh, homogeneity across countries on, on how to report um, financially related, um, um, climate related financial uh, implications. So, so what, can recommend, uh, what can regulators do? Well, there are a lot of more technical issues, like consider the, all these taxonomies that are being developed across countries to be interoperable, interoperable so they can, you know, if, uh, investors can you know, work in different markets without having a, a huge uh, compliance uh, burden. Uh, it's also important to align uh, roadmaps, taxonomies, and sustainable finance frameworks as well. Uh, all these tools need to be uh, together, and policymakers and regulators need to work together on this. Um, it's important also to ensure a fair and predictable enforcement of current green finance requirements, such as the ESRM, environmental and social um, risk management. Then, um, how do we, we have to be improve the monitoring, reporting, and verification as well, and uh, working with peer uh, um, institutions from other countries through so alliances like uh, NGFS. NGF, um, okay, so it's more or less uh, some, some of the things that regulators can do. Now, in terms of the private uh, entities, um, it's, it's very important to look at some of these numbers. For example, there are 5,000 uh, coal-fired uh, power plants uh, in Asia and the Pacific. So the transition away from, from coal uh, is going to be a major challenge because, uh, I mean, it's very expensive to retire early these facilities uh, and many, many are still being, you know, developed and there are new uh, coal-fired uh, power plants. So here the challenge is that uh, the region needs a lot more energy Right? And there is not enough time and financing to move faster uh, to renewable energy. So how do you do this? You know, it's, it's very challenging. So this is perhaps the major thing, a major issue that we have in our region. So um, there is also, in addition to GSS plus uh, bonds, there are GSS plus loans. And uh, there has been uh, an important increase also uh, in the region in this, um, of this type of loans. And again, they are heavily concentrated in the, in the larger countries. But if you look, for example, Indonesia is 5.2 billion, which is larger than the, the, issue, the issuance of uh, GSS plus bonds. In the case of Vietnam, too, it's close to 2 billion, uh, when Vietnam had very little issues of GSS plus uh, bonds. So it's, uh, it's advancing. So, um, regarding the energy uh, transition, well, this, this is, uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's a major, major challenge. Uh, but let me move on because I'm afraid that uh, we are you know, getting the, uh, to the end of 15 minutes, right? Okay. So, 
what can private finance do? Uh, establish ambitious net uh, zero pledges and set out interim transitions plans to reach net zero. Engage in partnership with policymakers and regulators, right? Not just uh, for the transact not just transactional approaches. Uh, invest in building the capacity of staff and systems. Project uh, developers and financial institutions can meet regularly to co-create investment projects and provide clarity on suit, uh, suitable sources in terms of financing. So I think this, this is important. Uh, I mean, if you develop a project in isolation from the finance, then you can come up with this, uh, the, you know, the situation that is not appropriate, it's not bankable, right? So it's better to engage the financiers uh, early on and discuss you know, how to set up these projects uh, simultaneously together with them. Um, okay, so this is more or less the idea. Uh, we have then the, a synthesis of all these recommendations in 10 principles that um, it would be a bit repetitious if I you know, read them all. But um, I think that some of the important elements is the, the idea of uh, finance uh, partnership, that uh, governments shouldn't work in isolation. They would collaborate with the private sector and with the regulators as well. Uh, the, again, this idea of NDC financing, we are going to stress it again and again because we think that this uh, low-hanging fruit uh, that you know, needs to be taken, you know, taken on board. Uh, policy coherence, um, that is, well, regarding to the taxation issues and, you know, uh, incentives um, to invest in, in, in renewable energy or climate action. Uh, so this is more or less, you know, some, some repetition. The idea of uh, uh, improving the capacities is, uh, of the financial personnel is essential. And, um, and then there is also some recommendations for, for the private finance, uh, you know, to enhance commitments to net zero. Uh, now, the issue of local currency, uh, I think, is, is important. Um, this is an area that goes, as I said, goes beyond uh, climate finance, but it's important to, uh, to find ways to enhance access to finance in, in local currency. So one way is to the development of the banking system, you know, that, that already exists, uh, and is there. There are people who want to save money, there are people who need to borrow money. So there's potential for uh, channeling more money from the uh, banking system into, into climate action. Uh, the development of local currency bond market is another uh, important activity in which uh, Southeast Asia is, is ahead of the curve, is, you know, is doing quite well. Um, so these, these, are, these are important things. Uh, it's very risky to, to rely on foreign currency financing uh, due to the currency risk. And then the, well, the collaboration with partners um, is also important. So I think I'm going to stop here, and uh, I appreciate your attention. I hope uh, it's more clear. This is the publication. Uh, you are welcome to download it for free uh, from the SCAP website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Is good for this insightful presentation on the gap, the financing gap, and we cannot emphasize enough the role of private finance in climate action. Obviously, there is not enough public finance out there to reach the climate goals. So we're going to weird this conversation into how the private capital can uh, play a role in achieving our climate finance goals. Uh, and now let me give the floor to Dr. Pichai Yasir Wunabud uh, from Asian Catalytic Green Finance Facility, ADB. And she's going to give a presentation on financing sustainable development. Is that correct? Thank you and welcome.
Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me uh, today in this uh, panel. So I'm glad that Alberto actually already made a presentation before me because a lot of messages in his presentation and his talk is actually a lot of what ADB is doing. Um, I'm not going to repeat uh, what he's already said, but my role today is just to give you a little bit of information with kind of these uh, financial instrument, with kind of the mechanism that actually what um, what the moderator just said, uh, to bring in, to crowd in the private capital uh, when it comes to sustainable uh, development. Okay, right. Um, so, a lot of his slide actually contain of the GFS plus bond or a debt instrument. I am um, pretty sure most of you already heard about what is the uh, GSS plus bond mean. Uh, in this term, I use the ESG because it's um, more common when it's go outside of the you know uh, international flow, or right? so it's more like a public knowing it's an ESG. Um, so. The tie of the bond is actually quite simple uh, when we're considering the use of the proceeds. We have the green bond that would go to the environmental uh, impact one. Uh, we have the social bond, which is obviously the social impact. And then we have the sustainability link, uh, sustainability bond, which uh, is a combination of the green and the social one. Uh, and these three types of the bonds is basically, you know, just to use the money that you capitalize or mobilize from the bond uh, into particular project. But then uh, when we're looking at this kind of uh, project, uh, there's also a, another type of bond that uh, Alberto has already mentioned is sustainable link bond or sustainability uh, link loans is that to, it's a, um, a performance link kind of type. You don't have to looking at the project in particular or the use of the proceeds, but at the same, but it's more like the performance of the overall of the corporate or the entity that issues bond. So this is like a, I just give you an idea of the type of the ESG bond that's available. Um, what I what I want to focus more is just uh, in ASEAN in particular, Southeast Asia. Uh, because the driving factor on the sustainable finance is actually have four angles. Um, of course, we see about the first one is like we see a, we heard about the risk, the climate is, that is not new anymore, uh, and that bring us a lot of awareness, not just international organization, it's also from the private sector and the public side, definitely, that bring in, uh, into this positive, uh, the factor that important uh, for this um, mechanism that crowd in the finance to the sustainable um, development. The opportunity that's already mentioned by the first speaker on the transition to lower the carbon economy. Uh, this is a sizable opportunity that bring in uh, for the financial sector to reduce the climate risk. We see the growing demand of the investor when it comes to sustainable investment and also when we consider the ESG resilience. Last but not least, we see a huge development in the area of regulations. The regulator, particularly in Southeast Asia, has done a lot in terms of facilitating the framework and the regulation as well as the guideline to be alive with international standard to help people, to help in, uh, the issuers in the region uh, with this sort of uh, debt instrument. Um, I'm just gonna skip this because I really heard, uh, already know what it is. But what I wanna show is just, when we come to the ESG goal, uh, the GSS plus bonds actually bring in the finance that could help in the contribution of this goal. At least what I started going in, it's uh, 15 out of 17. Um, so how actually we can do in terms of the sustainable bo uh, bonds in ASEAN? Uh, before I go into the, um, the mechanism, let me just give you a little bit of the uh, figures that um, focus on the ASEAN plus three. Uh, some of you may know that um, not only the ASEAN, they, we have the, uh, they have the ASEAN plus three uh, finance, uh, ASEAN plus three bond initiative. That actually the ADB is one of the, uh, is a secretariat of this group that 
develop the uh, sustainable bond initiative in the region. When Alberto said about the local currency uh, investment or local currency finance, this is what they're actually doing right now uh, to help the government in the region to issue the local currency bond. This is help them uh, with the exchange rate risk and also help them to able to mobilize the, the, the money to finance investment, sustainable investment project easier. Um, so let's just look at this uh, um, figure a little bit. We, as he mentioned, we see a little bit of a drop in 2021, 2022. Uh, that because of uh, the high interest rate that the, um, uh, yeah, that, uh, the, the long-term, at uh, the high interest rate in a certain period of time. But what we're expecting to see is that with the Fed the, uh, announced of the, to lower the interest rates, we may see the crowding of the money going to the uh, capital market more. And um, so sustainable bond market, I think, plus three equals 40, uh, 43%. But this... It sounds like it's a good news, but when we're looking at the overall, we see that the ESG bond only accounted for 2.1% of the general bond market. So it's like really small proportion here. Um, and when you're looking at the, uh, the, the size of the issuers, the, the, um, the share of the issuers, uh, the public sector hold bigger, uh, bigger share in the ASEAN ESG bond outstanding. But if you look at ASEAN plus three, which, me, which means we include Japan, Korea, and China, it, it happened to be the private sector who share bigger share. So um, interpretation of this is mean that with the uh, developing country, uh, it seemed like they need a lot of push from the public sector. But then when it's come to a more advanced country, uh, they have a more advanced capital market, uh, they're able just to crowd in the private capital in order just to invest in the city sustainable uh, uh, or green project. So in sum, the message from this graph is that there's a room for the private sector participation in the Southeast Asia ESG market. Um, so, what I mentioned earlier, just there's a lot of development in terms of the regulation, the lot of the guideline in ASEAN. I just brought you into this uh, slide just to give you an idea what has been done in the region. So, um, it's not a new things anymore because the green bond standard in ASEAN has already happened since 2017. And then they also have the social bond standard, then sustainable link bond standard. And recently, they just an, uh, announced the ASEAN Transition Finance Guideline. So these are the things that like, uh, they try to make to standardize when it comes to the bond is trend for um, uh, for this uh, GSS plus bond. Um, moreover, uh, you heard the, the term taxonomy in Alberto uh, presentation already. There's a collaboration, not just the capital market regulators, but also from the central bank and the insurance regulators. They work together to come up with the ASEAN taxonomy as a, you know, more like a Bible for bond issuance for the region. Uh, they already have three versions, and the last one is just come out this year. Okay, so um, with all in all, uh, we actually moving forward in this direction. It just depends is gradually, and we hope that it would be faster in the, in the few next years. Um, so what I want to highlight here in this slide is actually kind of similar and overlapping in when uh, what from the SCAP uh, report that just mentioned earlier. So the challenges one, uh, the challenges one is actually also bringing in the opportunity uh, to when this country uh, GSS plus bond. Um, we're talking three main challenges. The first one is the financial gap. The second one is the limitation of the large scale uh, and also bankable green project or sustainable project. Uh, last but not least, that we see a lot uh, in the Southeast Asian region is that the limited capacity 
the lack of uh, capacity and knowledge when it comes to the uh, GSS Plus bone. So the limited pool uh, of the bankable green, so bankable green and social project, the proposed solution that we have uh, is just to provide more technical assistance to develop uh, and identify eligible project. And concessional finance already mentioned by Alberto, uh, to de-risk and also to guarantee, to attract more cap uh, private capital. And the taxonomy that could be a benchmark and a Bible when it's come to uh, define the definition of the green or the sustainable or the social impact. Limited issues, but it's a challenge too, but um, when we're thinking about uh, the, the issues uh, in ASEAN, we always thought about the public sector as an issue. So we have to try to persuade more private sectors just to come in and play more role. Uh, at the same time, what we could do at this stage, we could encourage the state-owned enterprises uh, as well as the, municipal, uh, the, the municipality. This is uh, another uh, opportunity that come, come up uh, in the past um, couple of years. Um, the solution of the, uh, this one I already talked about, like to, it's hard to abate to the uh, industry um, require financing solution uh, to transition away from the fossil fuel. So we can use the sustainability link or uh, the transition bond with the clear credible uh, transition pathway. We need a tra uh, technology transfer from more developed con country just to come in from the donor. Uh, when it's come to ASEAN plus three, we, uh, we collaborate each other as a, you know, helping each other in that term. And then the integration of the um, technolo uh, technology. Last but not least, the diversity within the region uh, with when we come to the taxonomy, the guideline, the standard, that's another thing that we need to support and provide to all. <clears throat> so um, I just come to the last part when it's come to the ADB support. Uh, we have a lot uh, of the uh, initiatives that actually support the sustainable finance. Um, one of the ma two mains that I would like to talk about is we had this, um, what I'm working on the ASEAN Catalytic uh, Green Finance Facility, which is uh, not just the, if the facility would come by uh, in two, uh, two, two layer of the support. The first one, um, so we call it Southeast Asia Green Finance Up, which provide end-to-end -end support to the scale up uh, climate ambition in the region. The first support would focus on the project level. level which, uh, as I mentioned, because we have a challenge of the limited uh, large scale and also bankable green of uh, social project. So we help in terms of the concept and the project development. And to make this sort of project more attractive uh, to the investor, uh, the co-financing is other factor that could come to bill. And it's, as, um, uh, it's help to de-risk the project. Uh, some from time to time, this co uh, the co-financing, we also know as the blended finance. So it's a blended, uh, it's a finance from the public finance, the donor, the MDB like us, that actually provide the finance. And we work with the donor like uh, from Europe, uh, country, uh, like UK or whatsoever, just to get this concessional finance to help out. We provide, uh, uh, the, the, the other plus part is the capital, uh, capacity building and agenda setting support. We provide the knowledge capacity build and capacity building. We have the global partnership. Uh, and also we work with the ASEAN, uh, the ASEAN Secretariat in terms of give them a support when it comes to taxonomy and other uh, regional priorities. Uh, and this is such a, sa a, a sample of the, what we're doing at the ACGF. Um, they, uh, the first one is the GSS has bonds uh, initiative, which basically just to help the local, uh, the regional issuers who want to issue the GSS bond uh, from, end, from, from end to end. So we start with the project identify, uh, identification, and we help them all the way with the advisory support for the bond exchange. Uh, it's actually come kind of similar when it's come to, um, to the other example is the blue uh, is, uh, Southeast Asia Finance Hub. 
This one is actually focused on the impact on the ocean. Uh, so the first one, the, um, the hub is in Thailand, and the second one is in Indonesia. So what I just mentioned earlier, it is what we actually provided. We provided advisory support, the project pro uh, selection, and we helped them to develop the sustainable finance uh, framework. Uh, so um, as some of you may know, uh, they also need the external reviewer just to justify that uh, the framework is actually in line with international standard and the framework. So we help in terms of that one too. Once they have the framework, uh, and we have the project. We can also provide a showcase uh, the transaction at the international forum, just to help gain the investor uh, uh, attention and also just to crowd in the private capital. Uh, Alberto also mentioned about uh, ecosystem development. So that's also another t tier of the support that ADB uh, provided to the, uh, um, the, the Southeast Asia country. Um, so far, um, we already have 1.2 billion of the sustainable bonds capitalized in 2020 uh, with this initiative. And um, for uh, 12 billion in the subsequent issuance and for international awards since 2020. So this is just show you that um, with the effort that we put and working with the government and also local issuers, not just the government and also the company, the, there's a mechanism that help us to boost uh, the sustainable finance in the region, particularly when it comes to the ESG bond. Um, and that's just the, uh, the, um, the sample of what we, we did for Thailand, uh, sustainable link bond, uh, and this is help with the affordable uh, housing. Uh, this one is the green, first green bond by Thailand corporate uh, real estate and industrial developer. Uh, we have the Exim Bank for sustainable bond and also that cover the first blue bond in the country. Uh, we have Philippines with the gender bond and then uh, Indonesia for the social funding framework that also help the affordable housing. So all the information is available in the ADB website and if you have any question, uh, I'm at your disposal afterward. Thank you very much. Let me do a quick icebreaker. Um, you see here a QR code for our Mentimeter survey. I would like to ask you to scan this code and answer a few questions that we have there. So if you scan it and access the website, we're going to share all the results in the end of the session. Now let me move to my computer. Before, before I invite the next speaker, I would like to ask you a few questions. First, when you join this survey, just press a like button so I would see that you are there with us online. And I can see many likes already. Thank you. The few questions I'm going to ask you before I invite Dr. Kanita. We'd like to know more about you who is here with us today. So you should now be able to see the question as to what type of organization you represent. We give you a few options, government, development, financial organization, NGO, think tank or academia, and maybe other type of organization we may have forgotten to mention. I already see results from the survey. Thank you. Well, we will share everything later. Thank you. It's good to see so many people online. Maybe we have some people also online on the Zoom. I'm not sure. Thank you. And the next question, well, it's actually, can you go back? Oh, I can. I don't know what's happening. Um, uh, this is actually 
the part where if you have questions to our speakers, you can type the question in here. And I'm going to leave this one open until the end of presentations. And then afterwards, when we go to Q&A, if we have questions, we will be able to see them on Apologies. We will be able to see them on our screen, so we will put it on later and answer them. Thank you very much. Uh, and now let me invite our next speaker, Dr. Kanita from Chulalongkorn University. Take this, please. Thank you. Please welcome. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Also, thank you very much uh, for attending this uh, session, and also thank you to SEI for the invitation. So um, I'm going to take a little bit more of a micro view of climate resilience and climate finance. So um, I think before, um, from Dr. Alberto and Dr. Pitaya, you saw already that there is a great finance gap um, and to, in order to fill that gap, um, you saw the steps that countries and also private investors and multi-development, uh, multi-governmental development institutions have to do in order to facilitate climate finance. Um, so I would like to um, focus more on the activities um, that if we finance them, we can achieve um, climate resilience, um, especially in the context of Southeast Asian countries. Um, so I would like to focus on two things in particular. Uh, firstly, on circular economy, and secondly, on biodiversity conservation. And I'd just like to add that um, I would first start off by providing the rationale why it makes sense for Southeast Asian countries to invest in both the circular economy and also in biodiversity conservation and then I would give you, of course, the definitions of what they are and just some examples of the projects that have already been uh, implemented in both uh, circular economy financing and as well as biodiversity conservation financing. So let me begin. Right, so I think we all know already that Southeast Asia faces numerous challenges. So in terms of climate change, um, Southeast Asian countries are highly vulnerable to climate change. Um, if you've seen this before, you can see that um, the countries that are highly vulnerable based on data from 2000 to 2019 are the countries that are in redder colors. And you can see that Southeast Asia, even though it's very small, um, the coloring is very much more vibrant compared to other regions of the world. Um, so we are, in Southeast Asia, highly impacted by the changing climatic conditions. So that's the first challenge that we need to address. Uh, the second challenge we also need to address is that we have to also recognize that even though we are the recipients on the brunt end of climate change, we are also contributing to the problem. So if we look at uh, carbon dioxide emissions, you can see that most countries in Southeast Asia are still on the increasing trend of um, CO2 emissions. And if we look at greenhouse gas emissions as a whole, you can also see a similar pattern. So with very few exceptions, most countries in Southeast Asia are still emitting greenhouse gases. Uh, so then we have this challenge where we have to adapt to a changing climate and we also have to mitigate climate change. And to add to this, we also have the challenge that most countries in Southeast Asia are developing countries. So this means that we need to both adapt to climate change as well as mitigate climate change, but we also need to sustain our economic growth. So we have to address these three goals. Um, so how do we do it? So I would try to argue that if we invest in the circular economy and if we invest in biodiversity protection, we can maybe balance these three goals and also make Southeast Asia more climate resilient. So let me first uh, introduce the concept of the circular economy. And I think by uh, looking at the current 
type of economy, we can maybe better understand what a circular economy is. So if we look on the, your left-hand side, uh, that's the current state, uh, the model of economy that we are adopting today. So we call this a linear economy. So in a linear economy, we would extract natural resources from the environment and use them to make goods and also use them to provide services in an economy. And once we are done uh, with those goods and services, we then discard them as waste. Um, so this means that every time we want to increase production and consumption, um, we also have to take in new resources for the environment and also emit more waste as a result. Uh, this also means that uh, economic growth is inherently damaging to the environment because economic growth, as measured by gross domestic product, essentially measures the size of a country's production and consumption activities in a given year. So this means that if we grow, we increase production, we increase consumption. And in a linear economy model, growing means we take in more resources from the natural environment and also emit more waste as a result. So inherently, a linear economy is damaging to the environment, whether or not in terms of climate change, natural losses, and so forth and so on. Uh, so this means that if we shift the economy towards a more circular model, uh, essentially what we try to do is firstly we try to minimize the amount of new resources that we take in from the environment um, and then we also try to minimize the amount of waste that we generate as a result of production and consumption activities. And we're only able to do this if we try to maximize the use of the resources that we have already extracted from the environment. And so that's why we have a circular loop in the middle, um, whereby we take, in, we take resources, we use and reuse them, and recycle them and repair them, and so forth and so on, so that the materials that we have already extracted are used to the maximum amount possible until we have to discard them as waste. Or if we manage it well enough, um, some resources can be used and reused and reused and reused. Uh, for example, um, plastic bottles. Um, if we make new plastic, we need to extract petroleum and use the byproducts to make plastic. Uh, we also generate greenhouse gases as a result. Uh, once we use the plastic and we discard them um, without re recycling them, then we also um, generate emissions from the waste management activities. We also, um, if we don't manage the waste, they also go into rivers and streams and also um, cause damage to the oceans and so forth and so on. However, if we take the plastic that have already been used, recycle them, make them into new plastic bottles, uh, then we don't have to extract more from the environment and we don't have to emit waste as a result. So by doing so, we we retain the value of these resources and we also minimize the impacts on the environment. And when we do this, every time we cycle materials through the economy, we also generate green jobs and increase incomes for people. So this is the, the promise of a circular economy. And because of this promise, Southeast Asian countries are adopting circular economy as one of the goals that they want to invest in because it not only reduces impacts on the environment, uh, it also reduces greenhouse gas emissions from the economy and it also promises to bring in economic growth. Um, so that's why at the ASEAN level, um, the ASEAN economic community has already adopted circular economy as one of the goals that ASEAN wants to promote. And also in individual ASEAN countries, um, I know for example in Indonesia, in Vietnam, in Thailand, uh, circular economy is one of the key pillars of economic development for these countries. So countries are paying high attention to circular economy. Now, it's not easy to achieve this closed loop. It's quite difficult, um, but it is, uh, it promises, the promises, are, it also um, is quite rewarding as well. Uh, 
So let me now shift focus to biodiversity. So I think the key here is that we're already suffering from the impacts of climate change. Um, so the key is how do we uh, invest in activities that also helps us achieve climate resilience. And so looking at biodiversity as natural assets, um, it generates a lot of benefits in terms of climate resilience. So um, we call this ecosystem services that we get. Uh, so let me give you some examples. So for example, uh, a biodiverse ecosystem, so systems with lots of species, um, lots of ecosystems and so forth and so on, um, biodiversity helps make ecosystems more sustainable and they are more stable. So when they're more stable, it means that they can better, better withstand uh, the impacts on climate change. And when we don't have ecosystem collapse, it also helps sustain people who live near and around ecosystem. It also sustains ecosystem services that we get from the natural environment. Uh, secondly, um, ecosystems are also storage of carbon. Um, for example, mangroves store a lot of carbon. Um, so we get carbon sequestration benefits as well from biodiverse ecosystems. Um, we also get natural disaster mitigation from healthy ecosystems. Uh, I mentioned mangroves just now. So, for example, during um, the tsunami in 2004, um, areas that have mangroves on the coastline uh, were well protected because the mangroves act as a barrier to the waves coming in. It also acts also as barriers to storms and so forth and so on. And ecosystems within cities, for example, help absorb rainwater when we have a lot of rain and it also reduces flooding. Um, this is also true for areas where you are next to the forest. If you have healthy forest, um, it better regulates the water. And so you have less droughts and also less floods. Now, with increasingly severe climate change, if we have healthy ecosystems, we can help reduce the impacts from severe storms or severe droughts. So having a biodiverse ecosystems really, really helps in achieving climate resilience. So this is just some of the benefits of healthy ecosystems. Uh, so then the question becomes, uh, what things should we invest in uh, to have a circular economy and what things should we invest in to save biodiversity? Uh, and also let me just mention that we are uh, in the midst of a mass extinction um, in terms of biodiversity. So the last one was when the dinosaurs died. Um, now we're in the midst of another one um, because of human activities. So there is a lot of need to invest in biodiversity. Um, so let me shift back to circular economy before going back to talk about biodiversity. So in terms of the circular economy, so to have a functioning economy, to have a functioning production and consumption systems that is based on the rotation of natural resources and materials, we need to have functional businesses. We cannot have a sustainable economy if we do not have businesses that are aligned with circular economy practices. Uh, and so what are some of the businesses that are aligned with circular economy practices? So there are five key business models and the classification varies depending on what you, uh, which, which uh, materials you look at, but these are the five key ones. Uh, firstly, um, it's a business that uses circular inputs. So for example, if you have uh, businesses that uses recycled materials uh, in their production, um, that is counted as a circular economy business. Uh, secondly, you have businesses that um, are based on the concept of a sharing economy. So in a sharing economy, the idea is that once things are produced, um, they're not used to the maximum if it's just used by one person. So in a sharing economy, um, the good that is owned by one person can be shared among others. Uh, so for example, in, uh, in an apartment, um, so if you have, for example, multiple um, apartments, uh, you only live in one at one time, and the other ones are left vacant, right? But resources have already been used to build these apartments. So what you can do is that you can share them on platforms such as Airbnb to ensure that they are used to the maximum amount possible. This is the same as ride sharing 
hiring services and so forth and so on. So this is also aligned with circular economy practices. Uh, thirdly, we can have um, this model called product as a service. So for example, light bulbs. Um, if you buy a light bulb, then the consumers have to dispose of the light bulbs when it's broken. But if you buy lighting service, for example, uh, once the light bulb disappears, you have no light, then you can call the company to replace the light bulb. And the company can then get rid of the broken light bulb um, at much less cost compared to the consumer. So this is a product as a service model. Uh, fourthly, you can have a product use extension, so you can design products that can be mended, uh, your parts can be fixed, uh, so you don't have to throw away the whole product. That's a product use extension model. And fifth, you have a resource recovery model, so um, ensure that resources are recovered once they are finished and so forth and so on. So these are some of the practices that are aligned with circular economy and should be invested in. Uh, let me give you some examples of the circular economy businesses and the um, initiatives to attract investment. Uh, on the left, um, because I'm from Thailand, um, I'm give you the, giving you the example from Thailand. So on the left-hand side, um, in Thailand, we have the Board of Investment, and the Board of Investment um, provides essentially investment incentives for uh, other countries and also for local businesses to invest in uh, target activities that the Board of Investment wants to support. Uh, so in Thailand, we have what we call the BCG model of economic development, um, essentially a bio-circular and green economy model of economic development that the government wants to support. And so through the Board of Investment, um, can, uh, Investors who invest in BCG industries um, can then uh, gain tax benefits uh, in terms of corporate tax exemption and so forth and so on. So this is one way uh, to attract investment uh, into the country and ensure that uh, circular economy activities as well as BNG activities are invested in uh, at the country level. So this is one example. Uh, on the right-hand side, um, I'm not sure if you've heard of this company before, it's called Non Non. So Non in Thai means sleep. Um, so this company is a circular business. So what they do is they provide a product as a service model. So um, I'm, I'm sure that we have mattresses at home, right? And when we want to discard of the old mattress, it's always a huge headache because if, you, if the company where you buy a new mattress um, doesn't want to take your old mattress, we really don't know where we want to throw them away, right? So in a circular business model, um, you don't buy a mattress, but you rent a mattress service. So essentially, you pay a subscription fee uh, in order to get to use the mattress. So it's usually a monthly fee, um, and if you don't want to use the mattress anymore, uh, what you can do is you can call the company, and they will come to collect the mattress from you. And so uh, what the company does is that it would dismantle the mattress and then upcycle some of the parts, recycle some of the parts, or maybe throw some of the parts away as waste. And when, country, uh, when companies do this, they can do it at much more scale than a local consumer. And so this is why uh, this business is one of the circular businesses that is in operation today. And they also um, raise funds through a green bond, a very small one. But this is just an example. Okay. So let me give you um, some example of biodiversity conservation financing, or what we call biodiversity finance. Um, so there is an initiative um, at the global level, uh, which also has local chapters, and it's called the Biodiversity Finance Initiative. So it was an initiative that was born out of uh, one of the conference of the parties um, of the Convention for Biological Diversity um, of many years ago. And they have um, implementation in what we call biofin countries. So let me give you just three examples. On the left-hand side is in Kaw Tau, which is uh, in the southern part of Thailand. Uh, so essentially in Kaw Tau, we have um, roughly about half a million people visiting the island every year um, to enjoy scuba diving and so forth and so on. 
And what happens is that um, these activities impact on the ecosystems, especially the marine ecosystems. Um, so what uh, this model does is that it collects uh, fees um, from the tourists and use the fees to finance conservation and biodiversity related activities. Um, so this is the tourist um, user charge um, in Kao Tao and it's already been implemented. So if you've been to Kao Tao, you would have to pay, I think now 20 baht um, in order to, to for, for this fund. Also a similar thing, um, this is in Vietnam, so a similar thing, so you pay a user charge um, and then the charges are collected into a fund and the fund is used to conserve biodiversity or protect biodiversity. Uh, my final example um, is this one on the on the right, um, and it's a game. Um, so if you go to um, the App Store or the Play Store, uh, you can and search Animal Town, uh, you can find this game. Uh, and this game is an initiative uh, of Biofin Philippines. So essentially, when you download and play the game, um, you can choose the animals you want to collect and so forth and so on. And the game is free to play, but there are in-app purchases. And so uh, these in-app purchases raises funds uh, into a, a, a fund pool, and the pool is managed by um, the conservation partners, which also includes uh, Biofin UNDP in the Philippines, and also the local uh, Ministry for the Environment. So um, once the funds get generated, uh, the Ministry of the Environment would then uh, identify the channels for using the funds that is in line with the biodiversity plan for the Philippines. And so in this way, um, you find a channel for trapping into private finance um, and also uh, making sure that it gets invested um, in the activities that is aligned with national level goals of biodiversity. So these are some of the biodiversity finance examples. So that should be it. So thank you very much. And I'll be here for a while. So if you have any questions, uh, please let me know afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanita. Turns out climate finance can be also fun. Thank you for those examples. And let me now introduce our last but not least speaker, Ms. Hanle, CEO of IMPACT. Uh, she's going to speak about the role of SMEs. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Han Le, uh, founder of Impact. First of all, thank you for attending the session. Um, second of all, thank you, the organizer, for inviting me. That's my second time. Um, so look forward to continue uh, contributing inputs and, and, and hearing from, from the rest of you uh, as well. Um, so while waiting for my slides to be uploaded, if possible, um, just as a, a quick introduction about impact and about myself. So I'm strongly interested in supporting businesses in Southeast Asia to transform into sustainable leaders in their field. This is after following 18 years of working in sustainability, mainly with policy makers uh, in Asia Pacific and in Europe. Uh, now is the time uh, for businesses to take part. And as my previous speakers mentioned a lot, how to get private sector to invest, to join the action, right? So that's why I founded Impact, which is a boutique consultancy firm based in Singapore, supporting businesses to do just that. Um, our vision really is, um, and it is on the slide, but I can speak to it because it's our company. Um, our vision is to have sustainability at the core of our society and our economy. And our mission is to support businesses to integrate sustainability into their DNA. And this is very important to us. It is not window dressing. It has to be part of the DNA. And because just to echo 
the point from my previous speaker, Dr. Katina. We are in the middle of the sixth extinction, so it's, it's not for window dressing sustainability. So I will speak from, from the perspective of businesses today. I would like to share a little bit about the perspective of sustainable finance and businesses, and in particular, SMEs. Um, the, the, the conversations that we've had so far, I feel very lucky with the previous speakers. I don't have a lot of new things to say. Um, but there was one message that I would like to share. And before I get to that message, the sustainable finance landscape in, in ASEAN, it has grown a lot. Like uh, Dr. Pichaya was saying before, uh, I think on average over the last 10 years grow 200%. Uh, now in ASEAN, GSS bonds market, the outstanding um, uh, sustainable debt is around 73 billion US dollars. That's according to the latest. I just looked at it yesterday from Asia Bonds Online, a uh, data set from, from ADB. Uh, and the issuance last year was 19 billion US dollars. So it's, it is in the billions. Um, here you go. So it is... Um, I just skipped through. So voila. So it is in the billion, but I have. Ooh. Oh, you're doing it manually. I see. Okay. Um, yeah, but my 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 observation and our observation is, it is in the billions. It's growing a lot, but it's still quite small. The ASEAN sustainable debt market is still small. By what metric? Number one, it's too small compared to the region's conventional debt market. I think in, the, in, in Dr. Pichaya's uh, slide, uh, we mentioned 2.1%. Uh, um, here, in, we're looking at the ASEAN, because I think for yours is ASEAN plus three. There's 2.7%, but it's still quite small. In the developed uh, markets, it's around 20%. Um, here I say 5 to 16, but now it's about 20%. Then it's also small compared to the global sustainable debt market. It takes up about 1.8% of total outstanding uh, sustainable debt globally. Uh, and uh, as you see here in the bullet points, Malaysia and Philippines rank quite high in ASEAN, is on average uh, globally. So we still have quite a bit to, to catch up on. Uh, next slide, please. And also, another observation about the ASEAN GSS market is that it shows a gap of access for small firms. And how, why do we say that? Number one, the outreach of the sustainable debt market is to be limited. Um, between 2017 to 2021, according to a survey by the World Bank, there's about 51 firms that have issued bonds to this market and, and loans as well. And out of which is 31 are non-financial companies. So it's still within below 100. Uh, actually, 51 is much below 100. 70% um, of these issues are medium to large firms. And they are of investment grade, which means that their capacity, their resources are strong. And the average deal size, and this is an important point, and I'll come back to it later. The average deal size is 29 million US dollars. Meanwhile, SMEs would target around 7 million US dollars. Why? Because it's debt. We don't want to be indebted too much if we don't, want, if we don't need to. At the end of the day, it is still debt. Um, and, and then the third observation we have is that the proceed allocations do very much concentrate in the energy sector. It starts to grow in other sectors, but very much in the large infrastructure area. Next slide, please. So, financing gap. I think that's all we heard today. And thank God the numbers are consistent. I did a quick calculation uh, from the presentations before. They are consistent. So here, my key message is, we've got to move from the billions to the trillions. It doesn't matter what the numbers are, right? 19, 21, it's still in the billions. And what we need is a trillion. So the IFC uh, estimated we need about 17 trillion US dollars 
for climate-related investment by 2030. And it's consistent with what you were saying before, Dr. Alberto, uh, around three trillions per year. All right, so we have a financing gap. Now, I think that is a new message I would like to send. How do we bridge this gap? Actually, because I showed before, there's a gap of access to smaller firms in these markets. The, the way to bridge this gap is to provide that access to the SMEs. We have so many, we have millions, they are backbones of the economies in this region, but they do not have access. So our strategy and our thesis is to provide that access to SME. Next slide, please. Which doesn't say much, just say my key message. SME, financing SME, green transition. And how do, yeah, next slide, please. And so our number one recommendation that we would like to share with the audience today is enabling small deal sizes. Because that's going back to my point earlier, the average deal size is 29 million US dollars for an SME, 29 million US dollars loan is still a lot. So if we want to have sustainable finance towards SMEs, we recommend small deal sizes. That is key. So I would like to give an example of what it looks like, and it is possible. Next slide, please. So here's an example of a green bond for smallholder farmers in India. Symbiotics is the arranger and the leader for that bond. Uh, they're working with us, a uh, partner. Disclaimer, impact doesn't work on this bond in particular, but we are working towards having similar cases in ASEAN. This is the case in India. So this bond is about 7 million US dollars, a very small bond. Um, and actually, uh, Dr. Katina, you mentioned before with the, the mattress, with small bond. Small is good. Um, and because you look at a uh, bond transaction, 50 million US dollars and above because the transaction cost is quite high. So if you can have smaller bond size, it's very important. So in this case, the important thing I wanted to say is that it's about 7 million US dollars is given directly to... Um, uh, Samunati, uh, and Samunati will provide sub-loans to, directly to smallholder farmers. Um, and this, in this way, sustainable finance can go directly to the, to the smallholder farmers, to the small agri-SMEs uh, that's needed. Um, and actually, this bond is part, part of a larger basket bond that, is, that was uh, issued... At London, oh, sorry, at Luxembourg Stock Exchange and displayed at Luxembourg Green Exchange. So it have access to the global capital market. Um, it's not a small bond somewhere that doesn't quite meet the criteria, the international standards. It does meet international standards. It's listed in the international capital market, but it's small size. Um, so that is a, 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 just a quick example. Um, and uh, I just want the next slide, please. Uh, I won't take 15 minutes, and I just want to come back to my one key message. Small is beautiful. Let's enable small deal sizes for SME financing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we can go back to the slide deck that we had before. I would like to go back to our engagement tool. Oh, thank you. Um, so let us see if we have any questions. Let me check. The questions to the participants were on Mentimeters. So we have one question actually. I think it's to Dr. Pichaya. How can ADB manage the sustainable bonds to ensure the cash flows and pay the obligations? The sustainable projects may not be profitable. Well, thank you for the question. Um, so, as I mentioned, they, we, what I'm working on is under the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility. And what, what we're trying to do first is um, 
the first thing is just to identify the bankable for the green or the social project. So even though it's not profitable, uh, we're trying just to help them for at least in the first year and how to deal with that. Um, we use the concessional fund, which is actually uh, would provide you a lower interest rate uh, for the for the issuer and the, to 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 um to deal with, and also even provide um, a attractiveness to the investors to come in. Um, we also provide a capa uh, capacity building just in tr um, to help them uh, to make those kind of the project more bankable in the later years. Um, so it's just not like, okay, we help you to issue the water, we just leave, leave you. It's not like that. It, it's a process of the, like I said, end-to-end -end process. Also help in terms of bringing this sort of project into this uh, you know, international forum to do the showcase and bring in the investor and give more information. Um, I'm not so sure if I'm answering the question because I think you want to know what we do with the, no, <laughs> the project is not profitable. Uh, but in terms of, it, the part of my job is to make sure that that would happen, the profitable project and bankable project. So uh, when it become NPLs, that's no longer my job. It's another division just to come in and help. But be sure that um, we always make sure that to help uh, the issuers, uh, um, um, the, both the local one, the government one, the non-sovereign one, uh, just to move forward in particular when it comes to sustainability, uh, uh, sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Pichaya. Uh, we have uh, another question uh, to which I want to add something on. I think it's the question to all our speakers. Um, what do you think can governments do f further to facilitate innovative finance to reach communities impacted by climate change the most? And I would like to add on to this. Uh, there's quite a lot of attention to the communities which are what we call vulnerable groups of people. So um, can you share your insights as to what can be done so that the climate finance reaches the vulnerable communities. Please, Alberto. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, um, as I will give you an example. Uh, we have a project in Maldives on, the, um, on basically um, blue, blue finance. Um, so um, the government, of course, is very worried about climate change because the main assets of the country are related to the tourism industry, right? And um, the, the government is also in high level of debt at the moment. It's, it's a complicated macro situation. But they are uh, interested in the possibility of marketing blue bonds. And um, to do this properly, we are starting to support the government, you need to have uh, a proper way to, 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 to prepare these this credits, these uh, carbon credits, right? And uh, from our perspective, uh, it's important that these projects help the community, right? Um, it's a problem with, in general, with carbon, uh, carbon development of carbon credits that, uh, I mean, who is going to get the money at the end, right? So you need to make sure that these projects are well structured and actually provide opportunities to the communities that are that are involved, right? So that that could be one example. You know, we are we are exploring this possibility. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, have one more answer because I'm being told by the organizer that the time is up already and the coffee break is waiting for us. So please, Pichaya. All right, so when you issue the GSS bond, it, um, it, this is a process, right? So once you issue the bond, you use the, uh, the, uh, the money to allocate the um, sustainable project. Uh, after that, there's a monitoring site when they need to do the report. It's called a uh, sustainable report, right? Uh, they have this sort of indicator just to indicate the social impact or the green, uh, the environmental impact. Um, when it comes to the vulnerable group, particular for the social uh, bond, um, that's 
thing that they have to report that actually happening, the money actually used and go to the vulnerable group, like affordable housing, for example, or the gender bond, for example, to the SME, to empower women who actually own the SME. So this is this another type of the monitoring mechanism that we put in uh, just to make sure that uh, there's a, we can follow up uh, to the impact that actually made to the society. Thank you very much. And we are getting messages that the time is up. But we also have a few more questions. A few of them seem to be to our speaker, Hein Le. So uh, unfortunately, the time is up. We don't have time. However, if I'm guessing the people who ask those questions are here with us. So if you can approach Ms. Hein Le during, for instance, coffee break. I, I hope she will be eager to answer your questions. Quite a lot of uh, questions here are about SMEs. And this is an area we think that attention is underpaid to. Thank you very much, dear speakers and dear participants. Now, please welcome to the coffee break. Thank you. Thank you.